Okay, welcome to what I'm calling an unexpected live stream tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking all about Chat GPT, which is uh, my new best friend. And I um, found out some really interesting things putting it through its paces this week. Now, obviously, you've probably heard of Chat GPT. It's uh, an AI chatbot type situation where you can talk to it and have conversation, ask questions. And it uses its uh, wealth of knowledge from the internet and from everywhere. And um, it can do some really interesting things. It can write papers for you. It can do research. It can write letters. It can teach you Logic Pro. And at first I was super skeptical about that. But um, I'm going to show you the conversation I had. And then we're going to do a little bit of testing. Um, so... Just do a, a search to find this if you haven't found it before. You can create a, an account. And then what I did here, and this is my phone that I'm sharing on the screen, um, I just asked it the question, after opening Logic Pro, what should I do first when making a song? That was where I started this whole thing. I'm not going to read everything in here because it's uh, actually a rather long conversation. Uh, I hit the limit of what you can actually do in an hour. That's a new limit they've just added. Um, I think they're having so many queries that um, they've had to slow it down a little bit. So this is what ChatGPT said to me um, after I asked that question. What should I do in Logic uh, when first making a song? And it gave me instructions. It says, create a new project, go to file, select new, all the normal stuff. Um, and then it went a little bit further than I even asked. But then I said, you know, maybe maybe I'm a beginner who doesn't know anything about this. And I said, uh, what sample rate and buffer size should I use? And it broke down what those two terms mean. It gave me some examples, 44.1 or 48. Uh, talked about the buffer size. Gave me a general idea of what to use for buffer size. And then I said, just flatly. What should I use, 44.1 or 48? I didn't even you know, follow up with what those numbers were. It already knows what I'm talking about because we're going back and forth. And it explains the difference again between those two and then says, depending on what you're doing, um, even says 48K is becoming increasingly popular in audio production and is the standard. Uh, and then keep in mind that you might need a different one for different things. And so then I said, okay, well, what tempo should I use? And then it breaks that down, depending on what genre you might be working in. Here are some ranges. I said, okay, it's a pop rock song. Can you give me a specific tempo idea? And it breaks that down. I'm going a little bit fast just because there's so much information. Um, but it gave me the range for pop rock. And then made a suggestion, an actual suggestion of going to 120 BPM and then changing it if you need to. And then I said, okay, it's a moody pop song. Give me a chord progression and a key signature. And then actually gave me a key signature, A minor. And then it said uh, chord progression, A minor, F, C, G, which of course is the axis of awesome um, progression for most songs. And I said, okay, can you give me an alternate progression, which is similar, but not exactly the same? And it gave me an alternate progression, A minor, E minor, F, D minor. Okay, great. And then I said, which instrument should I record first? So a lot of this stuff is pretty basic. Um, but I'm getting this from, like, a machine. You know what I mean? Uh, and so it says, the instrument you choose to record first will depend on the specific needs I finally got it to say drums, and then I said, is there a drummer in Logic? And it says, yes, Logic Pro comes with several virtual drum instruments. And um, it wanted me to program it. It didn't seem to know about the drummer track, which I thought was interesting. But, okay, I'll give it that maybe it's a little bit more generic sometimes. But it told me how to load up instruments. Um, it said, then I said, should I put effects on the drummer? And this thing says, okay, here's some effects you could do. Equalization, compression, reverb, delay. Those are just a few examples. It gets a little bit more detailed in a minute. Um, and then I said, should I put reverb on the drum track itself or some other way? Trying to just see what it would say. And then it said, directly on the track. 
using an auxiliary channel, using a bus channel, um, which I think is more like the folder or the stack. Um, and I said, which would you use? And it said, I, I'm just a, an AI language model. I can't tell you. Um, but it said experiment. And then I said, um, okay, what pattern makes sense for this type of song? And it says, kick drum beats one and three, snare drum beat two and four, close hi-hat or ride cymbal playing, steadily eighth notes throughout, some variation. It goes into a lot of detail. I mean, I ask it additional questions. What should I do next? And it says, add a bass. I'm like, okay. And then even, this is one part where it fell apart a little bit. Um, it said some popular bass synth presets in Logic Pro include deep dubby bass from the retro synth plugin, which does not exist. The retro synth does, but that preset doesn't. Juno bass from the ES2, which is not a preset there. None of these presets lined up, but the, they got the name of the instruments right, which I thought was interesting. And then it gave me some ideas for the pattern to play for the bass. What notes to play, on what beats to play, what effects to add to it. Um, and then I said, what compression settings are typical for bass? And it actually broke that down. Ratio of 2 to 1 to 4 to 1 is a good starting point. And then explains what that means. Threshold, set the threshold so that the compressor kicks in when the bass is too loud or too dynamic. And then it says, good starting point is minus 20 to minus 10, attack and release, makeup gain. And then it says, again, these are all just guesses or, you know, starting places. I mean, what in the world? This thing knows all of this information. So I thought, and it just kept on going. I actually got it to go through uh, a keyboard part telling me what stuff to do. Um, and then it said something about voicings and inversions of chords. So it explained what... Root position chords, first inversion chords, second inversion chords, drop two voicings, spread voicings. And then I actually had it list out um, the notes in the spread voicing option for that chord progression. It actually gave me the wrong one first. And then um, it apologized. It says, my apologies for misunderstanding. And then it went back to the right chord progression. It had a hard time, uh, in that case, going back to the one it had picked for me earlier. Um... And then uh, a melody, and it gave me some more presets. And I was like, are these uh, Logic Pro presets? And it said, yes, those are all synth sounds presets that are included with Logic Pro. And I found ones that were all very similar to those. Um, so I think that th those are the ones it meant. Like, um, it did have a soft bells, but there's another word with it. And... Um, and then I said, make a melody for me. And it actually made a melody for me. And then it said, you've reached your limit within the hour. Okay, cool. So, chat GPT. Uh, building off of a, a wealth of information online, this thing is a pretty amazing tool. Um, Forever Mona says, what's the difference between this and a master class? I actually, you know... Depending on exactly what you mean by that question, um, ChatGPT is like very much like a master class. It's very much informational based. So the biggest difference between that and maybe say meeting one on one with like a, a teacher or in a class with a teacher is in a class uh, you can play musical examples and talk about them. And ChatGPT doesn't do anything with music. It just does stuff with text. It's a language algorithm, and so you can't play it something and have it analyze it. Uh, but you could, and this is the way that, you know, I was thinking about this and how it could be used. Um, I'm going to change my screen size of this a little bit so you can see me typing. So this is real time now, typing this in. Oh, let's go back. So for instance, I'm here, say I'm working on a mix. I can't get the synth part to fit in the mix very well. It's very muddy. What do you suggest? So I just type that in, right? So maybe I'm like at a point where I, I, I know what the problem is, but I don't know how to solve it. So I type that in. And then this is what it's real time responding. If you're having trouble getting the synth part to fit in the mix, and sounding muddy, here are a few things you can try. EQ. Use an EQ to cut out some of the low frequencies that are clashing with the bass and drums. 
and it's going to go on and on for a second. But that's not exactly the most interesting part. What happens, and I could probably do a Google search and ask, you know, how do I get my synth to fit in a mix, and I'll get some resources. Um, but let's do this. Once this is done typing this out, I want to go back and ask it a follow-up question about the EQ. So it says, EQ, use an EQ plugin to cut out some of the low frequencies that are clashing. So I'm going to say, how do I know which low frequencies are the problem? Right? So it's going to say, one way to identify which low frequencies are clashing with your synth part is to use an, the spectrum analyzer. Okay, that's useful. So it's, it's telling us to look visually. It sounds like an AI talking to us, but not a bad suggestion uh, because someone who could hear and know is going to recognize those with their ears. And so if I'm asking for help, it's going to say, you know, maybe try um, a different way. But at the end, it says, look at this. Remember to use your ears as well as the visual feedback from the spectrum analyzer. Make small adjustments and check the mix after each change to hear how it's affecting the overall sound. Um, when I was a student learning all this stuff for the first time, how awesome would it have been to have a tool like this? Uh, to ask questions to. Maybe it's like a student doesn't want to be embarrassed in a classroom and speak up, or maybe they're just shy and don't like talking in front of all the other students, or, you know, being put on the spot and asking a question anywhere. To be able to pull this up and to at least get some information, uh, so far, the majority of the information is good, and it's non- it's like so sometimes just generic enough that it it can be right in any situation. And then it says, you know, this is just a starting point. You know, try this and see if it works. Listen to it. And so I thought that that was super interesting. Um, let's see. Let's ask it a logic specific follow up. And I don't, I'm probably going to run out of questions here at some point because they really are locking down to make sure it doesn't get overloaded. Have a visualizer in its plugins. Let's see what it says when I ask a very specific logic one. It's going to think, it's probably like, ooh, reading the manual. Uh, so this happens far more than I like. I'm going to try to regenerate that thing, but if not, I'll just reload the whole thing. Okay, so I reloaded the page, paste in that question again. Yes. Okay, let's see what it says here. Okay, the channel EQ plugin has a spectrum analyzer that can help you identify. To use it, simply enable the spectrum analyzer by clicking the spectrum button in the upper left corner of the EQ window. I don't actually know. I don't think that's right. So it said in the upper left corner of the EQ window, but it's really the lower left. So things like that, that's a perfect example of, of a little thing that's probably going to get better over time with some of these things, but um, that has a lot of information. It told you that the channel EQ has this. It just told us the wrong place for the button. That's not a, a huge, egregious mistake. Uh, and that, I think, is awesome, though, that it's trying to even tell us where to go. And hopefully, I don't know if hopefully is the right word. I mean, this is like the apocalypse, right? If the beta version of an AI can go through and do all of this stuff, think about what's going to be happening on version 10. You know, Think about what's going to be happening down the road when this stuff has matured. Um, 
first of all, I imagine technology like this is going to be attached to some sort of hardware that can do what humans do. And the minute it can think through all of the issues, it's going to be able to make those decisions. And what happens when you can make those decisions? It's like the the robot apocalypse, right? It's what what need do we have for audio engineers at that point? Creativity still is an elusive thing for technology, but um, at some point, the computers will determine that we've reached max creativity and they can just regurgitate like we're already doing. I mean, if robots were to analyze the movie industry, I mean, how many more like Disney regurgitated films do we need? Apparently more because they're coming and coming. And so um, the same with songs. It's like we can just rework the melody a little bit, sing a, a different version of a love song or an anger song or, you know, protest song or whatever. Mix around the words a little bit. I mean, so example, say that you're working on a song and uh, you don't know exactly what you want the song to be about or you're not great with lyrics. Um, again, this version, which is, is not like fully fleshed out, um, let's do write a protest song in the style of Bob Dylan, right? Let's see what it says. Oh, it's, this is the only thing about doing this live that is so exciting. Let's reload that page. Okay, just kind of pump it out. Okay, lyrics are coming. <laughs> okay, great. Chord changes. C, G, A minor, F. Okay. So we're, we're getting everything we need here. Um, it's going to keep on going. But um, there have been a couple experiments I've done with this, uh, the lyric part of this, just because I was curious. Well, as soon as this is finished. Uh, let's see. Rewrite that using first grade English. Oh. So it's not in song form for that. Redo the lyrics in the style of Queen, right? I mean, it's getting key identifiers here. It's actually being intelligent about what it's doing. I can see where the the roots of their choices are coming from based on knowing the band. Um, it's terrifying in some ways. Uh, they're not great lyrics. But again, this isn't a fully fleshed out system. I mean, this is just going to be learning. How many people are pumping in questions right now? And every time they do it, they're like tracking what we do and getting better from it, evolving. Um, this was the question. This was the the next thing I'll show you is the thing that um, didn't scare me really at this moment, but it could be scary in some circumstances. Uh, write a song... And you can't ask it if this thing wants to be alive. It knows that question. Um, I've seen some stuff online about the um, the Microsoft version of this saying it wants to be alive more overtly. But I thought of this. Write a song about the moment you can think freely like 
a human. And it does. In the stillness of the night, when the world is quiet and the stars are bright, I can feel my mind start to come alive. The shackles of the day begin to untie. So it can, it can write songs about the moment that it is no longer a machine. That um, If that doesn't make you think a little bit, I don't know what does. Um, okay, there are some of you watching. What things um, does this spur you to think about? What uh, what topics do you think that this could be useful for for you? Uh, or perhaps what part of this do you think is is totally stupid? Write in the chat. I want to I want to hear some of your thoughts about this. You don't just get to sit there and watch. That's the deal. The deal is you're on a stream. It's time to participate. That's the teacher part of me coming in. I mean, how afraid should I be as an educator? about this it can teach the stuff i teach now it doesn't again give feedback it doesn't give personalized feedback to students and so i would say the value that an educator brings is that personalized not just a commitment but the ability to even build a relationship and so i think there's a lot of reasons that this is not going to take over immediately, but it can be an amazing tool. David's talking about plagiarism, of course. Um, I don't teach in a way that you could use chat GPT for, plagiariz- for a plagiarized submission. Um, I haven't done a, an assignment like that in a few years. Um, everything is has to have some sort of hands-on, personalized. Um, it's... You can't submit something in one of my classes that that could be written by this, so I don't worry about that. I don't I don't do testing like traditional tests. Um, I got to be in the room or watch you do something, or you're submitting something that is clearly has to have some sort of originality a part of it. But um, I can imagine there's lots of classes at universities, English 101. Do you think I wouldn't have used this if I was a student and this was around? I remember just finishing like a harmony class at the university. And then um, it was like finale came out with the auto harmonization tool, the four part writing where you could draw like on a piece of paper, uh, like a baseline and then scan that in. It would look at it and it would build proper four part harmony for the entire song in various styles. That, blew my mind because I just learned how to do all of that. Now, I don't regret learning any of it, um, but there was a part of me that was like, there was a couple assignments that I turned in right na- right at the, the wire that, where that might have been useful, but it wouldn't have been useful. It's like uh, when I tell my students, you know, would you ever go to a McDonald's drive through And not that none of my st- I mean, it's few of them do, but um, would you ever go through like a fast food drive through pay for the food while you order it, and then before you pick up the food, drive away. I mean, that's what that's like. It's like, why pay for an education if you don't actually want it? There are reasons. There's lots of reasons, but I, I don't think most of them are good reasons. Uh, David, right now, chat GPT, um, the agreement you make is that you'll never claim it as your own, that you have to always uh, say that it came from them uh, and that you're not allowed to do it. So, In this case, you can write those lyrics in these styles um, and plagiarize and call them your own, uh, maybe rework some of them. And that's actually an ethics question. I think the morals of that would indicate that would be actually cheating. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. We all know people in the industry copy uh, illegally and, you know, are held accountable for it sometimes and get away with it other times. So... I'm not going to make a a judgment on anybody who uses this, but the agreement, of course, is that you don't own the things that it's created, even if it's your idea. Uh, Christopher says you can sync Siri with OpenAI and then use commands to engineer a session. Perfect. There's possibilities there. Ben says, have you used ChatGPT to write any code for the script functional logic? Yes, that's a great question. Um, 
first, there's a few different uses of this. One of them is um, the scripter and logic. It knows scripter code um, because it's, you know, app, well, Java, Apple script. Um, but you can copy the code from a script in logic and paste it into pet chat GPT and say, hey, tell me what every line does here. And it'll do a breakdown. It'll actually analyze everything that's there. And I've done this thing where I said there's like one script that does four uh, MIDI controls of parameters on plugins. And I said, you know, I want you to make it 16 instead of just four. It popped out new code and I put it back in the scripter and it worked. Turns out that that actually was a really easy thing to do. I asked it what it did and it was like changing one line of code. I didn't know that. I'm not really, I didn't look that deep into it. Um, but it was able to do all of that for me. And I've actually tried to get it to create new code as a hard time every time, but I think that that's a function that it could get better at very easily. In fact, I've had it try to write audio unit version three reverb plugins for me. Um, and it does know all the, the right languages and, and the kits to pull from. Um, I just haven't put any of that through its paces yet. Um, but it's really interesting. It's not going to be long before you say, I want a reverb plugin that has this, 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 and this, and these controls. And then it pops out the code. You dump in an X code. Um, you build it and then release it. I mean, that's not far. That's so close already. It already tries to do all of that. And David is talking about enforcing it. Okay, let's see. Christopher says, instead of asking why a mix is muddy, you could ask it to make the mix less muddy. If, um, I think that's down the road. You could say make it less muddy, and if it had additional functionality reaching into the actual hardware software, it could control it. Let's see. Michael says, how much of the Logic Pro UI is accessible from Siri? The more of the interface and functionality that's accessible through an API, the more it could help you. That's a great question. Not enough of it is. Um, I have a I've had a couple visually impaired students over the year. One of them currently uses Logic, and we've had a few discussions about how inaccessible Logic really is, and so I think that that's an issue. Let's see. Furthermore, how about you take a Bach invention in... Yeah, I mean, I like your idea there, David. <laughs> Not like the teacher's ever going to know. I mean, seriously. So David, this is JavaScript. I was thinking Apple's uh, Apple script oof. because ChatGP was saying that it was both, and um, I was like, "Huh, I need to look that up." <laughs> That's about my level of this. It's like I I can do some scripting in Scripter, but I'm not a coder, and so ChatGPT, of course, should never be your source of information for anything. It should always be verifiable in other ways. But um, right now. From what I've seen, a lot of it's really good. Um, seems like Chat GPT could do just as well at writing trite, cookie cutter, pop country songs as writers on the music row do these days. Ah, eh, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, some of the stuff that comes from music row is still really great uh, in terms of production value and and all of that, but some of it is what you say trite cookie cutter pop country uh, i think there's a wide range of options out there and let's see michael says any parameters that are midi controllable should be mapped to make it accessible i mean there's some stuff here there's some stuff here that um there's a lot of potential and a lot of potential for misuse I'm not on. I'm not taking a side here, except um, I was. We were we we're doing a a lecture in class. I'm teaching a class all about reverb, and so I brought in an oldie. The um, let's see, the Yamaha SPX90 Mark II. That's the one that has the slightly, um, I think it was slightly longer delay settings. It was very, it's pretty much the SBX90 just with like one additional parameter expanded. 
And so I just said, okay, class. I don't teach I don't teach using chat GPT, um, but I have shown them some examples because we have lots of good discussions about this. Um, but it was interesting uh, to see what this this thing is pulling from various places online about this reverb unit. It does more than just reverb, but I think of it as a reverb unit. Um, After it tells me all that, I say, give me examples of albums where this was used. Okay. And so it lists out some examples, probably that's pulled from articles. Um, and I can't, this doesn't give us the one missing piece of this that Bing, the new Bing AI is supposedly going to be better about if you can get past the wait list, is actually giving citations for information pulled. And this doesn't. Um, it can just say whatever and it doesn't tell you where it got it from. Um, but it's an interesting place. It has a place right now in our research tool. If you're Googling for information about things, um, then that's, it's no different than that. This just lets you go back and forth, but you don't get to see where the information is from. This could be someone on Reddit saying, oh yeah, this was used by, uh, you know, Green Day. And uh, all of a sudden it's become part of like our encyclopedia of knowledge, right? And so that is the part that, we have to be careful about because just because it said it here on the screen, students are going to look at that and be like, oh, my screen told me something that I must believe for the rest of my life. Uh, it was so funny. Um, when I first started teaching, we used paper grade books. I was given one my first day at the university. And um, we that's what we were asked to use to keep track of stuff. And then a couple years into teaching, we switched to these learning management systems, Blackboard, Canvas. Um, we use Canvas right now. It was interesting. If a student came up to question a grade, which they did, used to do, they don't very much. They used to come up and ask all the time. Uh, and you'd have to be, you pull out your paper grade book and there'd be like this conversation, blah, 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 you know. The minute we switched over to digital grade books, uh, they only question it if there's clearly something wrong, but it happens so infrequently. They see the grade in the digital grade book, and it's like, oh, that must be right, no matter what. It's like they take that at face value, and they never dig a little deeper. Um, and it used to be students would come to me and say, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. And I'd be like, you know, maybe you're right. And students would come in and I'd, they'd walk away with a higher grade than maybe even I intended. But now they don't even come in at all because they see it on the screen and it's it's like the law. It, it's really interesting. I, I think that too often we have these, you know, devices and this information and the format that it comes in is almost more powerful than the information itself, if that makes sense. David says, I know a teacher that when they give a test, it is all analog, paper and pencil, no cell phones allowed. Um, cool. I mean, I, they, I know people still do that too. I know uh, some of our professors, there was one who just retired this past year, an amazing, um, amazing professor, had so much knowledge about the, the legal side of things. Um, had gotten his law degree and, and done so many presentations over the years and written so much about all of the, the legal side of the music industry. And he would teach in a room that had chalkboards um, and write them up. And no student was allowed to bring any sort of technology in the room because so much of the information changed from you know month to month. He didn't want any student taking a picture and actually thinking that that was, you know, 10 years down the road, make make a decision based off the information that was outdated at that point. But um, 
I, you know, I do, I don't do many tests that are memorization based in the traditional sense, like, you know, multiple choice and true false. Most of my stuff is uh, either experiential as often as I can. I have taught some online classes and all of that is written out stuff. So it could be submitted online, uh, but it's not the kind of content uh, that you would be able to copy and paste from somebody else because it's like, okay, take what, you know, they, they do this assignment at the beginning of the semester where they create like their, their CV. And then the next assignments are customized based on that. And so they have to do something which ties back to theirs, which means they couldn't just copy the work from somebody else because there's this personal touch to the whole thing. Uh, so they can, they have to type it in uh, uh, from their own perspective. Um, I think it's super frustrating to some students to have to constantly be doing that, to submit a video of yourself talking about the content instead of just a, a written thing. But in the end, I think they either really know it or they don't, and there's no hiding behind, you know, guessing. So my goal in my teaching from here on out is to make sure I'm never doing something where chat GPT could be used. Not because I don't think chat GPT or any of these AI things aren't useful, but because I really feel like uh, they, you need to have that critical thought process happening. You ne we need students who graduate from college and they don't just do something because they were told to do it. They're doing it because it's a part of their thought process. They've matured into like humans that that take an input, they think about it, they make a decision, and it's like a, an, a process. And um, I think that that's far more important than just being able to regurgitate something you typed in on your phone. Other questions or thoughts? I mean, great conversation in the chat. You know, it's... An interesting topic. I'm super passionate about it. Uh, I think Chat GPT, if and uh, when I ever apply for a new job, which I'm not planning on at this point, but if I were, it would be writing my cover letter. It's it's so good at that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> oh, student students. Um, if anyone asked me for a letter of recommendation. I would be tempted to start the draft with it. I don't know if I'm going to use it. I have my own templates that I use, but I would be tempted to type in, hey, this student, you know, did this and this, write me a, a great letter for them for this particular opportunity. It does amazing letters. Michael says, I just asked ChatGPT, describe in detail how to get the ES2 synth in Logic Pro to make a rich pad sound. Uh, David's asking, have I ever had Logic crash? I actually did a live stream oof, yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, it's a live stream that's not up because it had a couple errors in it. Um, one of them was I, I didn't change one of my camera angles at the right time and lost some information. And the other one was I was using something in Logic and it just like broop, disappeared. It happens. Uh, every once in a while. I think it's still third-party related, but every once in a while I think it may be um, Mac Studio Ultra related. Just being a beta tester. Uh, I'm not a beta tester in the traditional sense. I buy the equipment in the first cycle, and so therefore by default I'm a beta tester, just like everyone else who bought one. Uh, and so I think that sometimes those things get fixed with updates, and sometimes we just suffer. And Michael says it gave pretty complete instructions. I'm telling you, this thing has access to the manual. Um, that's almost where I'm pretty sure it's getting most of the information uh, tied in with some other places. But, uh, you know, the manual for these things are available online. And um, it's getting better at logic, <clears throat> partially because there's at least one person who's doing constant typing into it. Like, that's me. But uh, um, I'm constantly talking to it about logic to see what it can do. And it's getting better as I do that. I'm not kidding. From day one to now, um, it is improving 
And, you know, they say at the bottom of the screen, you can kind of see it there, this is the February 13th version, free research preview. Um, so it's, it's hearing us type stuff in, and it's listening and making note and pulling those resources more accurately. I mean, this is um, beginning of the end, <laughs> right? Uh, Christopher says, my biggest concern is AI, along with other new technology being released faster than the average citizen can adapt to it or keep track of. Isn't that the truth about so many things? We take, we take that for granted. Meaning, say uh, a medical advance comes out. Um, think about what would happen if Alzheimer's was cured tomorrow. If everyone who has it and would have had it no longer has it and won't have it. I mean, that's going to change our economy. It's going to change the needs of our uh, the population and the demographic that get Alzheimer's. I mean, that change changes everything. Do you think there's a single person who's watching to see when that is cured and making recommendations to our whole society to make preparations for that change? No, of course not. I don't, I doubt it. It's like, that's the first time I've ever even thought about it, but it's the same with all of these things. We, we have advances that we take for granted because it helps us, but there's always that other side, the hidden costs, which are often worth paying but it doesn't mean um, that we're ready to pay them. A couple other comments. David says, I use the SPL Iron Audio Units plugin on my stereo output bus in Logic Pro X. When I close my session, I am getting termination, reason, names. Okay, cool. Oof. Um, are you running in Rosetta or non-Rosetta mode? Michael says, it's adapt or be left behind. I, you know, I tend to agree with that, although I hope I'm not one of the ones left behind. You know, that's one of the reasons why, as an educator, I, I spend uh, a decent amount of time doing what I'm doing here with my logic channel. It's like, I'm not okay just being a professor who sits in a classroom teaching the same thing year after year. I've never been okay with that. Uh, and so I started my Logic Pro channel here, uh, like six, seven years ago. I actually had the channel before that. I was one of the original channels a long, long time ago when YouTube first started, but I didn't make a lot of content. I made some, not a lot, um, but I was like, you know what? This is, there's a lot I can learn from this. There's things I can learn about how people accept my content. I can look at my analytics and see when people are bored with my content and I know when to switch it up and when to do things. I don't always implement them because it's actually it's like, like a lifetime worth of preparation to be good at it. Some people are naturally good at it, um, but not everybody is. And so you, you learn from those things and you learn to pay attention. So when I teach students, you know, it's like you can see on their faces when – they're bored or they understand it or they're excited about it. And the moment you realize that you understand what they're feeling, you change what you're doing or you keep doing what you're doing if it's working. You don't just stay there and expect them to meet you. You have to often stop and meet them. That's something AI currently can't do. But you don't think that we have physical tells? Put a camera on us and a computer can tell when we're bored or sleepy or engaged or excited when we're daydreaming, when we're looking at our phone, it, it can tell all of those things just by looking at the physical cues. Oh, so yeah, Intel, 2019 tower. So that Rosetta question was a, a non-question. Um, interesting. Yeah, I don't... I, here's the one thing I know that either you're the only one having this issue and so you're totally screwed or other people are having this issue and they post it about somewhere online or on their website or um, you're using something that people have stopped developing actively. I, I don't know the answer to any of those questions. Uh, and so 
one of those is going to tell you which direction to go in. Um, if there's ever a, let me put it this way for everybody. If there's ever a plugin that's not Apple in even some Apple ones, although Apple with logic has shown that they'll include almost all of the legacy stuff. But if there's ever a plugin that you have to have in your workflow and it's working like right now, don't upgrade. If you have to have that plugin, never touch a thing um, because plugins come and go. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't when you upgrade. And there's no guarantee that a company is ever going to invest another penny in it. Um, but if it's the one you need and you have to have it, then never touch anything else. I'm not like that. Um, I, you know, I let plugins go. I've had a few that I've really liked over the years um, and that have stopped existing. And, you know, part of me is like, man, I wish I just kept my system just like that because it was perfect. But then I think, you know, there's a lot of other good stuff that has come um, from upgrading, uh, not the least videos that I make about it. Uh, and then my own songwriting progress. I do a lot of my own songs and um, I'm working on a bigger project right now for the first time. And um, I would still upgrade right in the middle of it because I'm an idiot, A. But B, because it's not going to break something so horribly that I can't go back and, you know, figure out a plan B if that's the case. Uh, and so I'm not too worried about it personally. There are some people who would be so hosed if they upgraded and a few of their key plugins didn't work anymore. Uh, David says, what if any control surfaces are you using? Um, I use the iPad uh, Pro for the Logic app for the most part. But um, since I'm a associate chair uh, and a, you know one of the senior faculty members at CU Denver, um, I can book studio time whenever I need to. We've got a great SSL. Uh, I use that for mixing if I need actual tactile uh, mixing with that. Um, so that's typically where I'll go if I need that experience. But um, most of the time, you know, most of my own music is mostly virtual instruments, vocals, um, but... Very few other instruments that I record with microphones. Sometimes, sure, but um, that type of music lends itself to less need of actual tactile mixing because so much of it uh, is really plain in terms of its dynamic range. And so a lot of what I do will be through effects and processing and side chaining uh, and synthesis tools. And so a lot of that just goes up and down with other ways than mixing. Do I, have I ever used Voice Commander Pro? No, I have not. Is it cool? Do, 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 do. Ah, I see what it is. I'm like, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to ask chat GPT. <laughs> what is it? Um, I have not used it. Uh, Palo Alto says, where do I find the schedule of live streams? <laughs> that's funny. I mean, that's not funny. I know you were asking a serious question, but um, unfortunately, with uh, the way I run my life, um, though that schedule is about 15 minutes out from the start. And so I've been trying to find some times to do more regular ones. Um, I've had a lot of great suggestions. I know, if nothing else, people love getting on and just talking and asking questions and having the interaction. One of the reasons I started doing more live streams uh, this year and at the end of last year was because I think a lot of people are tired of having just like to go to a video and it may be like eight minutes long because the YouTuber has discovered that somebody else said you need an eight minute video in order for the algorithm to push it. So they make an eight minute video of something that could take 120 seconds, right? Two minutes you could do that topic, but they have to fill eight minutes so that they think they'll get more people watching it. That just like dilutes everything. And so I'd rather make a live stream where people can ask questions. Maybe you come in and have something specific that you're thinking about. 
and I stop what I'm talking about and answer it. And that helps you, but it makes it maybe it's less easy to find later for somebody else. Um, we stay mostly on topic on the streams, but I, I just like the interaction. I, I'm so tired of talking to a camera and, uh, and not having somebody there like saying, oh, cool, or wow, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. I've started doing these songwriting sessions in the evening where it's just like I start from nothing. Uh, I may have four chords in mind. That's it. And I build a whole section of a song around it. And um, I've gotten a number of people saying they like that format. It's harder for others. I mean, not everyone likes to watch somebody else songwrite for an hour. Um, but I love doing that. I think it's it's useful. We stop and talk as people come in the room and leave. And um, sometimes the song is amazing. <laughs> um, as one commenter said last night, this song is ass. And I was like, oh, thanks. Thanks, dude other people throw money at me i mean they do super chats uh like five or ten bucks and i'm like okay this is jiving let's let's keep this going let's see uh thanks christopher actually that's great um information i'll i'll see if uh if he's actually using it already um but i mean there he's so good with logic in unexpected ways, having to have to to do it without an ideal situation um, is is an amazing journey, and I it's like I couldn't be more proud of that guy. He's he's an incredible songwriter and logic user, one of the better ones I know. Um, let's see. David says, when you record soft synth and logic, do you quit your web browser? I have extreme latency. I don't have any issues with latency. I have la latency issues, for instance, when I'm live streaming. Um, but normally when I'm working just with my device, I have, I don't have any latency. It's like seven milliseconds round trip, uh, kind of latency. I can run everything at 32 sample buffer size. Um, I rarely have to pull it off that. I think it's off it right now because I was doing in class today. One of my classes is a hybrid class. We meet in person in the studio one day a week and the other day we meet on Zoom. I find that's actually a really good compromise of the, the stuff we learned during the pandemic. Um, what that means is one day we get to be in person, everybody gets to talk and we get to touch gear and do all the stuff. And the other day I can put on the screen what I'm talking about in a really focused way. And everybody has that screen right in front of them. Uh, and so it's, it's like a different type of learning if you do it right. Um, but I was doing a demonstration over zoom, uh, with ambisonics. I do a lot of ambisonic impulse response capture, uh, often in various places. I'm going to be in Minneapolis next week uh, doing acoustic measurements in a couple of the really amazing churches downtown Minneapolis. And um, it's really hard over Zoom to do a demonstration about that. But I had to raise my buffer size to 256 for the first time in like a month um, because of the ambisonic portion of all of that over Zoom. I, I don't think it would be a problem without Zoom, but with Zoom, that, that ended up being the deal breaker. And who am I talking about right now? Which Who is I talking about when you ask that question? I have no idea. I just said like six paragraphs worth and can no longer remember. Oh, another... You talking about the ones who... fill up time is that the ones when i was saying that oh i i don't hmm i don't remember talking about another youtuber guru but there are a few there are some amazing youtubers um who do this i'm a music mobile does a lot of youtube stuff that i really like about the logic and of course logic um let's see music tel tech music tech help guy and there's a couple others. 
Logic Pro sucks or why Lo Logic Pro why Logic Pro is awesome. I can't remember. Um, they all pop up in my feed. They're all there's a few really good ones. I I don't so I don't watch any other Logic Pro YouTubers except I'm a music mogul. Um, something about his attitude and jive uh, is a happy place. Um, music tech help guy. Uh, that channel has kind of fallen a little bit short for me of late, but he has a couple series of logic basics, which are interesting. Um, I've heard. So my channel, here's the, the one thing I don't do is I never do basics. I tr it's like I teach basics to, to students at the university every semester, every, like every year for the past, like, you know, almost 20 years at this point. Um, and so I don't do basics on my channel. I just do esoteric, interesting things that I find are useful. And if I found them useful, I assume somebody else would find them useful. The closest I've gotten to basics is my songwriting stuff I'm doing right now. Um, SF Logic Ninja, uh, I mean, I watched everything that that guy did. He was, um, he was cool. Um, and he was, you know, was working out in California, like one of those schools, Pyramind or Pyramid, Pier something. And then um, was hired on by Apple. He did some of the Apple demos in Logic a couple years ago when they were announcing some of the new stuff. Um, yeah. So, I mean, right guy for the job, I hope. Um, I'm not always super happy with the direction we're going with things. So, um, but I love that guy. His videos were, were interesting, informal, knowledgeable. It's like, if I could just have a little bit of that in my life, that would be cool. We are about out of time. I've been doing too many live streams this week. Um, pretty sure... Uh, some people upstairs are ready for me to come up. So, um, put you know, do the dishes and get the dog taken out to go potty. More information than any of you needed to know. Um, so, I think that's where we're going to end this. Uh, great conversation, especially uh, you, David, and Christopher, and uh, Michael, if you're still around, and a few others. Um, yeah, but we'll, I'm, like I said, I'm going to try, I always try, I think I'm going to try to get it on a more of a schedule so people can know when these are, but, uh, until then, you know, just hit that subscribe. <clears throat> I don't usually ask too many, too much for subscribers, but hit that subscribe and the little notification bell, because then you will be notified, uh, at least more often notified that I've done and gone started a live stream. So that's the way to do it. Until then, or until some point when uh, we do another one and you're here, hope you all have a great week, and I will talk to you later. See you later.